I invite you to open your Bibles with me to Galatians chapter 2 and verse number 20 will be our text for our study today. Galatians 2.20, it's a verse that's very familiar to us. We read it and we sing it and we quote it. A lot of us can and we know the words of it. And I hope that in our study today we can learn the true meaning of it and focus on what Paul really meant when he said, I am crucified with Christ. The verse says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul says, I am crucified with Christ, and I think sometimes we tell ourselves that we know what it means, but I wonder if we really do understand the depths of what Paul was teaching here. What does it mean to be crucified with Christ? It's a question that we often ask and consider and think about when we read this verse and we hear it quoted and sung as we mentioned. We wonder what, is that, what does that really entail? But you know, the Bible gives us a very clear picture of what it means to be crucified with Christ. Because when Jesus was crucified, there were two men who were crucified with Christ. Those two thieves were nailed to crosses just like Jesus. They were crucified with Christ. And that's what it means. It's just that serious. Paul is not talking lightly here when he says, I'm crucified with Christ. In our Bible class in, on Sunday mornings, we've been studying in Galatians and we've talked about how in chapter 1, in verse number 6, after a few introductory remarks, Paul jumps right to the heart of the matter in the churches of Galatia. And he is amazed that they were being removed from Christ and from his gospel to some false teaching that men were presenting to them. And as we talked about this morning, he makes it very clear that those who do that and those who follow that are doomed to destruction. The matters that he's discussing in the book of Galatians are of utmost importance. And it's just as important when he says, I am crucified with Christ. He's not making a joke. It's not, you know, some vague allegory that we don't fully grasp. He means that we as Christians are crucified with Christ. A death has taken place. And in the immediate context, we learn what that has to do with. We learn that there's a line in the sand. It's been drawn, and there's no going back. In the context, he's talking about his relationship to the law of Moses. He says in verse 19, For I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. In order to live unto God, he had to die to the law of Moses. And for all of his life, Paul had lived under the law of Moses. He'd lived by the law of Moses. That was what guided and governed his life, or at least he thought it did. He, he followed the traditions of the Pharisees. But you understand the principle. What he came to learn, of course, is that the law of Moses came to its end with Jesus. There was a line drawn in the sand, and Paul says there's no going back. Because God drew this line, he fulfilled the law of Moses in Christ, I cannot go back to it. God has taken it away, he's removed it, he's nailed it to the cross, so we can't go back. As much as Paul had an attachment to the law of Moses in his former life, he's crucified with Christ. He is dead to that law. It can no longer have any power over him. And that means when Christians started trying to bind circumcision on other Christians, Paul had to tell them, you're doomed to destruction. You're accursed from God because there's a line drawn and you can't go back to the law of Moses. To do that is to no longer be a follower of Christ. It's no longer to obey the gospel. If you have a Bible that has both the Old and New Testaments in it. If you turn in your Bible to Matthew chapter 1 and verse 1, there's a very important you know, thing that happens in these books. The Bible, of course, is divided into two sections. There's the Old Testament, and that ends over here on this page, Malachi chapter 4. It's the end of the Old Testament. And then you turn the page, and you have Matthew chapter 1 and verse 1. And in between them, in my Bible, and it is in most Bibles, there's just a, a page that's not text of Scripture, but it says, mine has, you know, this is the, the beginning of the New Testament, and it has a chart on the back. This is the dividing line. It's the line in the sand. 
And God has put it there intentionally to say that when you become a Christian, you are dead to every other law except the gospel of Christ. And that's what Paul means when he says, I am crucified with Christ. The old law is ended. There's no going back. Whatever law I was following before I came, became a Christian, there's no going back. If I were brought up in a denominational church, I can't go back to that because there's a line that's been drawn, a line in the sand, and I'm crucified with Christ. But he also means not only that the old law is ended, but he means that the old man is dead. Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. So there's a living that continues even though a death has taken place. Now he emphasizes the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God. That's the gospel, not by the law of Moses. I'm dead to that. I live by the gospel. But he's also emphasizing that I'm living as a new man. And that's explained to us in chapter 5 and verse 24 of Galatians. And here again what Paul writes. He says, And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. And we understand that that statement comes at the end of the list of the works of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. And after writing about those two and contrasting those two, Paul says the one who is a Christian, the one that belongs to Christ has crucified, put to death, nailed to the cross, the flesh and the affections and the lusts that go along with it. We're no longer living under the flesh, following the works of the flesh, doing what the flesh wants us to do, but we live unto the Spirit. The Holy Spirit guides us through God's Word, and our focus is on spiritual things. And the emphasis, again, with crucifixion is there's no going back. I can't go back to the life that I used to live before I became a Christian. I mean, I can, but if I do, I'm not a Christian anymore. I'm not a faithful follower of Christ. I can lose my reward. I can lose my salvation. And so one who belongs to Christ has crucified the flesh. The old man is dead. In fact, that's exactly what Paul taught us happens when we obey the gospel. God's plan of salvation is when we hear his word, we believe what it teaches us about Jesus, that he is God's son and that he is our savior and the only hope of salvation. And we believe in him so strongly that we listen to what he says and we obey it. We submit to him. So we repent of our sins. We confess him as Lord in Christ. And then we're baptized for the remission of our sins. And in Romans 6, 3 and 4, Paul talks about that baptism. And he says, therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death that, like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So we reenact the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ. We die to sin. We bury that old man in the water. And what is raised is a new man walking in newness of life, and it's a line in the sand, and there's no going back because I'm crucified with Christ. But in the third place, he also shows us that being crucified with Christ means that the old life is done. And we see that in chapter 6 of Galatians in verse 14. He says, but God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. Paul says my old life is done. I'm done letting the world tell me how to think and how to act and how to live and how to speak and how to dress and where to go and what to do. The world has no more power over me, no more influence over me because I'm crucified with Christ. And it's a shame that we as Christians have failed to learn that lesson, that we are still letting the world tell us how to view the world. We let the world tell us what we're supposed to think about the world instead of letting God tell us. There are still so many of us who won't believe it unless we see it on the television. Unless we hear somebody in authority tell us that it's true, we won't believe that it's true. But we won't go to God's word and read what he says about it. We let the world tell us how we're supposed to think and how we're supposed to feel and what's supposed to be important to us. 
And so we put our focus on worldly things, on having more, having more money, having more possessions, having this and having that, going to this place and doing this thing, all because the world is telling us to do it. And that's not who a Christian is. A Christian is crucified to the world, and the world is crucified to us. It doesn't matter what the television says or what the Internet says or what my friends say or what whoever says. It matters what God says. And there are so many things that are happening in our world that, that are, are just outright deceptions and lies. You know, there's a reason that those, those things we watch on television are called programs because that's what they do. They program us to see the world the way the world wants us to see it. There, there's an intelligence unit in our government that made a statement one time where they said, we will know that we're successful when everything that every American believes is a lie. And they're pretty close to it because we let them tell us how the world is instead of what God says. And it's something I mentioned a lot, and I bring it up because I've talked about it for years and for years, uh, and it's more controversial today, I guess, than it ever has been. But this whole idea of man destroying the planet, climate change and whatever, that's a, a man-made idea. It used to be global cooling, and then it was global warming, and neither of those happened, so they just called it climate change because the climate changes. It's the way the world works. But they had tried to make it that we are destroying the world, and we buy into that, and we listen to them say these things, and we believe it, because we don't read what God said. God said this world is going to stand until Jesus comes back. We're not going to destroy it. And that doesn't mean we shouldn't care about it and, and those things, but it means God's in control. We're not. But we let the world tell us how to think when it comes to so, so many things. We have to turn that television off and start listening to what God says and spend our time with him and in his word because we're crucified to the world. And the influence of the world needs to be gotten out of the church. We don't want to be like them. We want to be like Jesus because we're crucified with him. Or at least that's who we're supposed to be. So there's a line in the sand that is drawn when I'm crucified with Christ. The old law has ended and there's no going back. The old man is dead and there's no going back. The old life is done and there's no going back. I'm not going to listen to those things anymore. I'm only following Jesus. And so that line in the sand leads to a life in the service. And I want to mention three things in connection with this, what it is to live a life in the service of Jesus, the one to whom we are crucified, the one through whom we are crucified. First of all, when we become followers of Jesus, there is no plan B. Back in 1 Kings chapter 19, we have the story of Elisha's call to be a prophet of God. And in this chapter, we're actually reading about Elijah. And Elijah, of course, uh, had done great things for God, and then he got discouraged, and he said, I'm the only one left. Everybody else has abandoned the truth, and nobody's following God. And he was feeling sorry for himself and down and discouraged, and God said, Elijah, you know, what's wrong with you? There's 7,000 people in Israel who have never bowed the knee to Baal. And he meant by that, get up and get back to work. And so verse 19 says that Elijah, he departed thence and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen before him, and he with the 12th. And Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. And before we read the rest of this, notice something important here, that Elisha was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen. That means he was a wealthy man. Uh, it was a big deal in those days to have one yoke of oxen, to have the oxen and the yoke to join them together. But to have 12 meant not only that you could afford all those animals and all those yokes, but you had enough land that needed 12 yoke of oxen. And you had enough money to pay the people to help till the land and, and do the crops and all of that. This was a man of wealth, a man who had... Uh, a farm, which was apparently a way of life and producing money and wealth for him. And Elijah passes by one day and takes off his outer coat, that coat of, of camel's skin, right? That rough garment, which was the garment of a prophet, and became that sim you know, symbolized what a prophet was. And he threw that thing over on Elisha. And verse 20 says, He left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow thee. And he said unto him, Go back again, for what have I done to thee? 
And he returned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slew them and boiled their flesh with the instruments of the oxen and gave unto the people and they did eat. Then he arose and went after Elijah and ministered unto him. And so Elijah, tossing his mantle upon Elisha, was a sign that he'd been called to be a prophet and to be a servant of Elijah, to follow him and to learn from him and ultimately to carry on after him. Well, when that happened, what did Elisha do? He said to Elijah, let me go back and you know, say goodbye to my parents, and then I'll follow you. And Elijah says to him, go back again, for what have I done unto thee? And sometimes people read that as a rebuke, but I don't think that's what it is. He, he's saying to him, you know, why are you asking me for permission to go back? This is between you and God, right? If you need to go say goodbye to your family, go say goodbye to your family, whatever. But Elijah says, go do what you need to do. And that's exactly what he did. But look what he did. When Elisha went back, he went to those oxen and he killed them. And then he took the yoke that had been joining those oxen together that he'd been plowing with and he built a fire with it and he boiled those animals and then he shared a meal with his family and his friends. And this was his goodbye party. This was Elisha saying, there's no plan B. God has called me to be a prophet. I'm not going to be a farmer anymore. And to make sure of that, I'm killing my oxen and I'm burning the yoke and I'm leaving my family and I'm leaving my household and I'm leaving my land and I may never see you anymore again. So let's have this last meal together because this is a line in the sand and there is no plan B. And what we learn from that, of course, is that when we become Christians, when we make that good confession and we claim that Jesus is Lord and Christ, we are saying that I life now belongs to him and there is no plan B. There's no going back to the former way of life. There's no going back to the former system of belief or way of doing things. We have to burn our yoke. We have to kill our oxen. We have to draw a line in the sand and make sure that we're never going to go back to that way of life. There's the story told from history about Cortez in uh, 1519, February 19th, he sailed to uh, Mexico. And when he made that journey, there were 11 ships. They had 13 horses, 110 sailors, 553 soldiers. Cortez landed in Mexico and uh, the indigenous population at that time, the Aztecs, has been estimated to have been approximately 5 million people. So the odds for Cortez and his conquistadors was 7,541 to 1. For every one of them, there were over 7,500 Aztecs. So what did Cortez do? Well, he sent one ship back to Spain, hopefully to get some information to the king and, and get the right to colonize and then he commanded his sailors and his soldiers to burn the ships and they didn't actually burn them they scuttled them they, they sunk them but the point was we're hopelessly outnumbered but there is no plan b now put aside the morality or the immorality of doing that to them and what they did to the indigenous people but understand the principle this is where we are this is what we're going to do there's no plan B. And it has to be that way in the Christian life. If I am crucified with Christ, there is no plan B. There is no living for myself anymore because I've said Jesus is Lord. I have to live for him. There's no doing it any way other than the way that Jesus said. There's no doing anything other than what Jesus says to do. And I have committed my life and devoted myself to that way of living. That's what we say when we say I am crucified with Christ. That's what we say when we make that good confession. That's what happens when we're baptized into Christ and we're raised to walk in newness of life. We've burned the ships. We've burned the ox and we, we killed them and burned the yoke. There's no going back. Now, add to that the principle of total commitment. And I want us to remind us what we read in Genesis 22 about Abraham. And I know that we know this story very well. But God said to Abraham in verse number 2, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him therefore a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. 
Have you ever, ever noticed, I, it never really connected with me until I was studying on this lesson, that God says to Abraham, get thee into the land of Moriah. Remember back in Genesis 12 when God first spoke to Abraham, what he said? He said, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house. God told Abraham, get out of this place and go to this place that I'm going to lead you to. And now after Abraham has done that, by faith, trusting in God, he obeyed his will. Now God says, get thee to Mount Moriah. It's the same God, it's the same command, essentially, go where I send you. And the question is, will Abraham do it? Well, he did it the first time, and he's learned, of course, through all of the tests and trials that he's been to, the faithfulness of God. So when God says, get thee to Mount Moriah and kill Isaac, Abraham, verse 3 says, he rose up early in the morning, saddled his ass, took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son, clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went into the place which God had told him of. Without question, without doubt, Abraham packed up and went. It had to have been a challenge for Abraham to leave his homeland to go to a place where he didn't know where he was going, but just to say goodbye to all the things that he knew and that he'd been associated with and was familiar with, to leave that and, and to go. But it also had to be a, an even greater challenge to be separated from his family. And we know that it was because it took him some time to do that. It, his father died in, in Haran, and it took some, a while for him to finally be separated from Lot when they came into the land of Canaan. But ultimately, he did it because that's what God told him to do, and that's not easy to do. But those smaller challenges were preparing him for the bigger ones. And God wants to know from Abraham, are you really with me? Are you totally committed to, to me and to this life that I have called you to live? If you are, then go sacrifice the son of promise. And Abraham had so much faith in God that he went to the mountain. He drew back the knife. He was ready to plunge it into his son to kill him when God stopped him. And God never intended for Isaac to be killed, and he wasn't going to allow that to happen. It was a test, as the Bible says, a test of Abraham's faith, a test of his commitment. And that's the principle that we need to learn. When we say there's no plan B, we have to totally commit ourselves to plan A, which is to live the life that Jesus tells us to live, to go where he tells us to go, to do what he tells us to do. Total commitment, no matter what God asks of us. About a century ago, there were a group of uh, missionaries in the religious world who came to be known as one-way missionaries. And they were called that because they determined to, to go to places that were very dangerous to preach the gospel. And the story that's told about them is that when the time came to pack up and, and to sail away, they didn't pack suitcases, but they packed coffins. They took all of their stuff and they put it in coffins. They bought one-way tickets. They said goodbye to their family because they knew they were never coming back. And there was one man in particular, his name was A.W. Milne, and he decided to go to uh, islands in the South Pacific that were inhabited by headhunters. And he knew that every missionary that had been to those islands before him had been killed. But he packed his coffin and he got on the boat and he sailed. And he went to those islands. And he lived the next 35 years on those islands. And it's said that when he died, the villagers buried him in the very center of their village. And they erected a tombstone and carved on it these words. When he came, there was no light. When he left, there was no darkness. This was a man who wasn't even teaching the truth of Scripture. But look at the faith that he had and the commitment that he had. That this may be the last time I see my homeland. And it was. And my family. But I'm going. Because I am crucified with Christ. My life is not my own anymore. And so he sailed and he accomplished great things in the sense of, you know, being an influence on those people there. But he did it because of his conviction about following Jesus. That's what we mean when we talk about total commitment. And to do that demands sacrifice. And God expects us to sacrifice. I just remind us very quickly about what the Bible says concerning the prophets of God. Luke, of course, 11 talks about how they were all persecuted. And he talks about from righteous Abel all the way to Zechariah, you know, who was slain between the altar and the, and the temple. All of the prophets of God 
suffered persecution. And Stephen, in preaching about the history of God's people in Acts 7 and verse 52, he says, Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and the murderers. Which prophet did they not oppose? You can't name one. Every prophet of God was opposed even by the people of God, persecuted by those who should have been the ones to hear their words. Yet for some reason, we've developed the idea that being a Christian means to live in safety where we never hurt anybody's feelings and no one ever gets angry with us and, and there's never any trouble. Smooth water, smooth sailing, that's all it's supposed to be for the life of a Christian. But we didn't get that idea from the Bible. I don't know where it came from, but it didn't come from God's word. Every prophet of God was persecuted. What about the apostles of Jesus? Acts chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, we read about James. Uh, James, of course, the brother of John. And the Bible tells us about Herod in verse 1. About that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church, and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And then he was ready to do the same to Peter. You remember James and John, they were Boanerges, the sons of thunder. They wanted to call down fire from heaven and destroy a village of the Samaritans. They wanted to sit at the right hand and the left hand of Jesus in his kingdom. And Jesus asked them, are you able to be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with, to drink the cup that I will drink? And what did they say? Both of them, we are able. Well, guess what, James? We're going to find out if you are. When Jesus was talking about that baptism, he meant the baptism of suffering. And James is the first apostle to be martyred, to be killed for the faith. Indeed, he was baptized with the same baptism that Jesus suffered. What about John, his brother? We know John was the last one to die, and apparently he died of natural causes. But when we go to Revelation chapter 1, we learn, of course, that life wasn't easy for John either. Verse 9, he says, I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. For preaching God's word and telling the truth about Jesus, he was exiled to Patmos. And do some research on that island of Patmos and what it was like and how rocky and barren and uninhabited it was. And here's an apostle of Christ exiled. Tradition says that he was exiled after he was ordered to be um, immersed in boiling oil. And whether or not they actually tried to do that and it didn't kill him or something changed and they ended up exiling him, John didn't escape persecution either. You want to talk about the other apostles? You know, I know it's tradition. We don't know exactly what happened to them. But just think with me for a few moments about what we're told. We're told that Luke was hung uh, by the neck from an olive tree in the country of Greece. We're told that Thomas was pierced with a pine spear after he was tortured with red-hot plates, and then he was burned alive in India. In AD 54, uh, a man named Hierapolis tortured Philip and crucified him because Philip had preached the gospel, and this man's wife had become a follower of Jesus. And he hated him for it, so he killed him. While Philip was being crucified, even hanging on the cross, he kept on preaching the gospel. We're told that Matthew was stabbed in the back in Ethiopia. We're told that Bartholomew was flogged to death in the region of Armenia. James the Less, we're told, was thrown off of the southeast pinnacle of the temple in Jerusalem, but it didn't kill him. He survived the fall, so a mob clubbed him to death. Simon the Zealot was crucified in AD 74 by a governor of Syria. Thaddeus, we're told, was beaten to death with sticks in Mesopotamia. Matthias, the one who took the place of Judas, was stoned to death and then beheaded. And, of course, the tradition is that Peter was crucified uh, upside down. The point is they all suffered persecution, yet we've come to think that being a Christian is to be an easy life where there's no confrontation and there's no challenge and everything is nice and smooth. But that's not what it means to be crucified with Christ. 
In Acts 7 and verse number 59, of course, the Bible tells us that they stoned Stephen. For what reason? Simply for preaching the gospel. He told those who were listening to him exactly who they were and what their spiritual condition was. They had murdered the Son of God. They were stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and in ears. In Revelation 2.13, Jesus says, I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. And thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. It wasn't just the apostles who were persecuted and who were killed. It was just the everyday, ordinary Christian. And we need to understand that in, in the first century church, you know, and I think I mentioned this in, in Bible class a, a couple of lessons ago, that to us, the idea of being persecuted and being willing to be persecuted for following Jesus is, is radical. We think that's crazy. If somebody is behaving in such a way that it makes people you know, want to put them in prison, well, they're not really living the gospel. But in the first century, they woke up every day thinking, who's going to persecute me today? Who's going to get mad when I tell them about Jesus and go tell the, the governor to arrest me? and put me in prison, and then what's going to happen? Every day, it was their normal way of life. If I preach the gospel, people are going to get angry, and they're going to retaliate against me. And they knew that it could happen at any time, and they were okay with that. I mean, they didn't want to be persecuted, but they were willing to take that risk because they were crucified with Christ. You understand what it means when that old life is done? They didn't care anymore about, is somebody going to kill me? It didn't, it didn't matter. If they do, that's okay because they crucified Jesus. They killed the apostles. They persecuted every prophet of God. So why shouldn't I be persecuted? They understood it's the way of life of a Christian, and they embraced it. And again, it doesn't mean that they liked it, but they understood what it was and the reason for it because they were crucified with Christ. It literally meant giving up everything about their old lives to devote themselves to Jesus. And to show that, I want to read with you from Acts chapter uh, 8, starting in verse number 1. And this is our, our third point and our final point. There's a line in the sand. There's no going back. So, therefore, it's a life in the service. We have to devote ourselves and be willing to sacrifice to live for Jesus. And that produces a loyalty in the scattering. Acts chapter 1, 8 and verse 1. Saul was consenting unto his death, and at that time there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout all the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. And verse 4 says, Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. There are some things that are implied in this passage, and one of them is that there is a scattering. That if you live for Jesus... You're going to be persecuted, and you may have to scatter. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean we'll have to leave home as it did for them, but it means we have to be willing to, right? But we're going to be opposed. Now, I want us to think about who we're talking about here. It says the church which was at Jerusalem. So where did the church at Jerusalem come from? How did it come into existence? Well, the day of Pentecost, right? So on the day of Pentecost, about 3,000 souls obeyed the gospel. Who were those 3,000 souls? Where did they come from? Did they all just live there in Jerusalem? Of course not. They came from all parts of the known world, the Roman world. They came to Jerusalem for the feast of Pentecost, right? They weren't planning to move to Jerusalem. They didn't get up when they planned their trip and say, hey, we're never coming back home. They were going to the feast, and then they were going to come back home. But when they got to Jerusalem, they found something. His name was Jesus. And they found the forgiveness offered through his blood. They found fellowship in his body, the church, and they didn't go back home. They stayed in Jerusalem. Not only did they stay in Jerusalem, but those houses that they had back in those places that they came from, they sold them. And they gave the money to the church. The land that they owned in those places, they sold it. And they gave the money to the church. They killed their oxen and they burned the yoke. Right? They burned the ships. There's no going back. 
They had no intention of staying in Jerusalem, but when they found the pearl of great price, that's all that mattered anymore. They were crucified with Christ. Their lives completely changed, and they became residents of Jerusalem for one reason, because that's where the church was. That's where the church was. We can't come back on Sunday night or Wednesday night. We care so little about the church. We don't understand what they understood about what we have in Christ. It's worth everything, and they sacrificed everything. And what did they get for it? Persecution. They saw their brothers and sisters being arrested and being killed, and then the persecution became so strong that they were scattered abroad. This home that they had made in Jerusalem wasn't their home anymore. And they had to go out into the regions of Judea and into Samaria. And they didn't know where they were going, but they had to go. But there was a loyalty in the scattering. When they left Jerusalem, they didn't leave Jesus there. They took him with them. And really, he took them with him, right? They were following him. He wasn't following them. But they went everywhere preaching the word. Listen, those people who came to Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost, they didn't plan to stay. They weren't moving. They didn't have any intention of selling their lands and their homes, but they did all of that. Let me tell you something else. They had no intention of becoming preachers, but every one of them did. Not just the apostles. They stayed in Jerusalem, but every Christian became a preacher of the gospel. Not just one or two who went to school to learn how to be a preacher, but every Christian became an evangelist. And when they were scattered, the places they went, they told people about Jesus. And when they did that, guess what? People got mad at them, and people hated them, and people persecuted them. But they established congregations anyway. And the church began to spread like a wildfire because of the loyalty that they had to Jesus. Their loyalty wasn't to their house that they used to live in, to the land they used to own. Their loyalty even wasn't to Jerusalem. Their only loyalty was to Christ. And that's what it means to be crucified with Christ. I have to be more loyal to him than to my material possessions, more loyal to Jesus than to my bank account. He has to come first. Even if I have to sell all I have and give the money to the poor, Jesus comes first. Like we read this morning about the widow, she cast in all her living. Why? Because her loyalty was to God, not to her money. I have to be more loyal to Jesus than I am to my family. If I have to leave them, then I'll leave them because I'm loyal to Christ. I have to be more loyal to Jesus than to whoever, my political party, my favorite candidate, doesn't matter. Jesus has to come first. I have to be more loyal to him than to my country, than to my city, than to my town, even to my congregation. If the church starts going astray and doing things that are not right according to God's word and they won't change, I can't just go along with that and say, well, my family's buried over here in the cemetery, so I can't leave because how can I leave you know, Grandma, who's laying, I can't be more loyal to a body corrupting in the ground and a name on a tombstone than I am to Jesus because I'm crucified with Christ. That's what it means to put Jesus first. He has to be first above everything or he's not really our Lord. And when Paul says, I am crucified with Christ, those are serious words. They, they carry with them serious consequences that I'm put to death to every other law that, that exists only to the gospel. Am I going to live my life? The old man is dead. I'm not going to do those sinful things I used to do before. I can't go back. And that old life is done. I don't live that way anymore. I don't listen to the world anymore. I'm only following Jesus. And with total commitment and a willing to sacrifice and a loyalty to him that overcomes everything else, then and only then can I truly say I'm crucified with him. And then and only then can I do that which pleases him and be the influence for good that I need to and bring souls to him by teaching the gospel as I should. We are to be that influence in our world. I read a report just this past week that was kind of shocking. I don't know why it shouldn't be, I guess, but, but it still was. Did you know that in the United States of America today there are more pagans 
than there are Presbyterians? What's happened to our culture? Paganism, you understand, is worshiping nature and worshiping false gods. There are more people who do that in this country today, and I'm not advocating for Presbyterianism, obviously, but, but at least they believe in God and, and at least nominally in the Bible. What's happening to our culture? It's not about who's in the White House or who's in, in the governor's chair. You know, it, It's about the church. We have stopped influencing our world for good. We're letting the world influence us. And until we crucify ourselves with Christ, we'll never be the light that we're supposed to be in this world of darkness. So I hope that we'll be challenged by our study together today and that it will motivate us to greater service. Just like we sang about earlier, we want to be on that higher ground. Well, the only way to get there is to press on. And that means to daily crucify myself with Christ and live for him. Can you say today that you're crucified with Christ? Honestly, that you're truly living for Jesus above everything else? If not, then I hope you'll make the decision to change that. Give your life to him in obedience to his gospel. If you're ready to be baptized, we can help you do that. And the things that we've talked about already, if you have done that and haven't been faithful and need to come back home to him, repent of your sins, confess them, pray for forgiveness, we'll pray with you and for you. God longs to forgive and to restore and to lead us to that eternal home in heaven. If you have sins that need to be made right, why not come forward and let that be known as we stand and as we sing. It's so sweet.